go to the square mile. The side of two. Side of two. So that was the best side of one. But let's hope you're not leaving my car. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a number of questions, and I'm quite sure there are a lot of others who want to ask you questions. But I'll ask you one, and if you allow me, maybe two. Uh, what happened in South Carolina on Wednesday? A friend of mine commented that all Muslims must be feeling a sigh of relief. It was the white basis for the white supremacist young man who committed those nine murders. I want to get your reflections and how it impacts Canada. This is what happened. Tragic, very tragic there. But if it was a Muslim person, he would have been a terrorist. White young man is not a crazy guy. So I just want your reflection. And if you're looking for the second question, it might be a simple, simpler one. I want your reflection on NDP victory in Alberta and how that will impact Canada in terms of trade relations and economy. Well, two very interesting questions and entirely different from each other. And I'll try to approach the second one in a nonpartisan fashion as well. Look, I couldn't agree with you more that there's a very different treatment in the media depending on if someone is a Muslim attacker and has committed a violent act, and a non-Muslim. And it's very disturbing to me, and I think it's disturbing to many people. We have our own example of this within Canada. And we know exactly how the conservative cabinet ministers responded to a, remember the, the plot to, to kill people in uh, just in, the, in regional Halifax and Dartmouth in the Big Mac Mall. I remember you heard about this? Yeah. And it was, thank goodness, the RCMP disrupt found out about this. They were communicating over internet. People came up from the US, some neo-Nazi white supremacists came up from the US to join uh, some disaffected and uh, disgraceful Nova Scotians who felt that they were drawn to white supremacy and they made links over internet. And I think it was that basically, from what I remember, the facts of this case, some of their friends called the cops and said, they've gone crazy and they think they're going to kill people at Mick Mac Mall, you've got to stop them. And Peter McKay was asked if this was a terrorist plot. And he said, no, because there wasn't a cultural motivation. <laughs> now, I don't know why white supremacists and Nazis are a class apart from terror. This, this horror, on my family background, my grandfather was from Charleston, South Carolina, and I know that church, and I know that community, and it's, it's unbearable. I mean, especially when I, I thought at first, I don't know why it makes any difference, but when I realized that young man had been sitting with them in Bible study, and that they had been sharing with him and opening their hearts to him, and then he felt that it's a more cold-blooded, horrific murder somehow than almost anything I've I mean, it's just awful, and, it, and dear old grannies there, and sweet, dear people who would open their, that's the thing, is they probably saw him and thought, well, this poor white kid is here at our black church. He seems lost, poor soul. I mean, they were helping him, and then he murdered them. But you're right, if it had been, if it had been uh, not a white killer, if it had been an Islamic uh, disaffected youth of the same, mental illness pattern drawn to the wrong craziness, he would have been described as a terrorist as opposed to someone who was just deeply disturbed. How does that affect Canada? How does it, well I said we had the same thing happen around yes. the, the Mac Mall thing. I think it means in terms of Bill C-51, which we've been debating a lot in Parliament, we've also, we've had a lot of rhetoric aimed at the Muslim community. And the, I don't know how many of you saw probably the low point of everything I've ever witnessed in Parliament in the last four years was last week, was when the Liberal, Ralph Goodale said, and I don't think he was out of line, he said, look, whenever we ask a question about terrorists, the response from the conservatives is to start talking about the Muslim community. But we're talking about terrorists overall, and you always respond, and Chris Alexander, was Minister of Immigration, stood up and said, you're the racist party. You've been racist forever. Oh, yeah, oh, you can find this exchange on YouTube. Because the next, it went on for a while, and it was, I've never heard 
such heckling, it was the worst ever. And uh, the next person recognized by the Speaker of the House was Peggy Nash, who's a friend of mine in the NDP. And the Speaker then re recognized the honorable member for um, Toronto High Park. And after that exchange, Peggy started by just saying, whoa. <laughs> like, I've never heard anyone start a question with question for me. We were speechless. It was the worst. It was really low. The other example of that, I would say, is, is the, the attempt to make the uh, face covering in a citizenship ceremony an issue. Yeah. He said the niqab is an issue. In the dying days of Parliament, as in yesterday, they put forward a new bill to make it illegal to have your face covered in a citizenship ceremony. Now, the, the niqab case that went to court was because uh, Jason Kenney had, without any judicial authority or legislative authority, as Minister of Immigration, created a guideline which he sent out to all citizenship judges to say no one should have their face covered during a citizenship ceremony. People thought it was a charter case when the court struck that down, but it wasn't a charter case. The judge looked at it and said, the Minister of Immigration has no authority to issue that dictate. Moreover, the guidance for citizenship ceremonies that has been passed by Parliament says that members of people, that, that new Canadians coming to their citizenship ceremony, and I don't know how many of you have ever been to a citizenship ceremony, but they're beautiful. And they're particularly beautiful because the act says new Canadians coming to their citizenship ceremony are encouraged to wear their national costumes if they want. So you have a kind of a rainbow array of beautiful young men from Africa wearing their traditional garb, and you've got people coming from uh, Eastern Europe wearing their traditional, you know, it's beautiful. And this young woman, this woman, she was just a professional and certainly took the case to court, she wore a niqab. And in the House of Commons, once the court ruled that you couldn't tell her she couldn't take her citizenship oath while wearing her niqab, uh, Harper said, what do you, I mean, this culture is, he said, quite frankly, anti-women. Now this again is stirring things up against one particular culture. Now the worst example of this, I think I, I skipped over it, telling you about the acts that went through Parliament this year, but I worked on a lot, is an act which has now passed the House of Commons. If you've never heard of this act, I'm glad you're all sitting down, because you would faint to think that we have legislation. This is the title. Zero Tolerance for a Barbaric Cultural Practices Act. <laughs> now you might wonder what, what, what possibly they're taking aim at here. If you think it's the residential school system, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act makes it illegal in this country to have honor killing. And conservatives have stood up in the House and said, if you don't think you opposition members of parliament, that honor killings are not barbaric. They are a barbaric cultural practice, to which I keep pointing out to them. Killing was always illegal. <laughs> Murder is pretty much the definition of always illegal. Since Moses got the tablets, always illegal. <laughs> but they are stirred up as though our country was a wild west of honor killings without punishment because we had not taken a stand against this barbaric cultural practice of honor killing. So the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act also makes it illegal to force women into polygamous marriages. Number one, polygamous marriages, already illegal. <laughs> Forcing someone into a marriage is already illegal. Kidnapping someone to force them into a marriage, already illegal. Beating your daughter because she won't do what you say, already illegal. So again, it's stirring up cultural difference. It's incendiary language. It's deliberately uh, intended to push emotional hot buttons. And when we're in a context where there are reasons to be concerned about cultural difference, and I think sensible leadership says we need to create better cross-cultural dialogue. We need greater levels of understanding. We need to make sure that if there's a young Islamic youth who thinks this culture rejects them and wants to eliminate their culture, we need to reach out to them and say, no, that's not true. This is Canada. We've always been the most successful country.
country on earth in welcoming cultural and ethnic diversity. So that's where I, I agree with you entirely. That that's exactly a, a concern I have is that one group of people are being treated differently than others. And in the process, we may be missing, for instance, violent crime is going down across Canada. But one place where there are violent crimes is in drug, organized drugs, organized uh, crime around drug sales, and organized uh, gang crime. And because of the constant discussion of radical jihadi extremism, they are pulling RCMP officers off organized crime and gangs on the Lower Mainland to pull them onto the quest for jihadi extremists. So I think it actually undermines public safety to focus on one and miss the other. And gun crimes of any kind, and it, I'm so glad that this, this, these uh, horrible uh, white supremacists in Nova Scotia, with they were they come well, as I said, most of them had come in from the U.S., but they made friends on the internet. I'm glad that obviously it was wonderful the RCMP inter interceded, and that never came to pass. But had that come to pass, it doesn't matter who's carrying out a violent attack. The point is, you don't want Canadians or anyone to be harmed through violent attacks, the motivation is hardly relevant. Um, and certainly the ethnic origin should not be the main thing that attracts police attention. Now your other question about what is the election uh, of Alberta mean in trade relations, and I'm wondering if you're thinking about Keystone Pipeline or what aspect of trade. Uh, certainly uh, Rachel Notley, one thing Rachel Notley's victory shows is that when voter turnout increases, all bets are off. Now, as bad as voter turnout was in Alberta, and it was only 58%, but that was the highest voter turnout in Alberta in 22 years. <laughs> in 2008, Alberta's provincial election, 2008, only 40% of Albertans voted. 60% stayed home. So when people in Alberta finally began to notice that it looked like the progressive conservatives under Jim Prentice had done so many things that offended so many people that the level of public anger was reaching territory that they had not seen before. People who hadn't voted for quite a long time decided to give it a try. So I think that's a very interesting conclusion. It certainly, she said that she will not push the Keystone Pipeline as hard as previous conservatives had. She's not against it, she's just not pushing it. She's not gonna push Enbridge and Northern Gateway. But they are still pushing for Energy East and Kinder Morgan. And that aligns exactly with where the federal NDP is. So I don't think we'll see the federal NDP veer off that because they'll also want to keep their provincial cousins on the same page. But I do have hopes that perhaps we can get Alberta to adopt a much more progressive approach to climate change. Because, you know, I think, I think obviously, well, I, I, I only got to meet Rachel Lockley for like, 30 seconds, we were trying to get a meeting when I was in Edmonton for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities meeting, because there is a path for Alberta to reduce its greenhouse gases dramatically and fast, and it's shutting down coal-fired power. So the electricity in Alberta is generated by coal-fired power, and there's just as many greenhouse gases in Alberta created by their electricity generating sector as by the oil sector. So the fastest route for them to get to start doing you. And, and then I think once we're past that hurdle, we can have national energy plans, national climate plans, and not be tiptoeing around Alberta as though it's a problem. Alberta has to be part of the solution. And it's, it, they've, got the, they've got capacity there to make the changes. So you are next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, there was a bill, a member's bill, went uh, through to the Senate, and it basically limited the PMO offices um, this is this was a bill put forward in the House by Michael Chong, conservative member from Wellington Halton Hills. The first version of that bill he showed me years ago, and it was actually why I didn't take my private member's bill to the same effect. I, I, I put my Lyme disease bill through, I had one or the other, and I knew Michael was bringing his bill forward, and I thought he'd have a better chance than me. The things his bill did at first reading, it no longer does. At first reading, his bill did what my 
Klein did, which is to say that under the Elections Act right now, the leader of federal political parties has to sign the nomination papers for every candidate, which has only been the law of the land since 1970, which for those of you who are young, and there are some young ones in the room, sounds like the Stone Age anyway, but 1970 is fairly recently. And when they made that change, and it was because they never had before on the ballot in Canada shown the political party next to the name of the candidate, so for instance, in Quebec, apparently, particularly Quebec, they would have several candidates with the same name. Pierre Leblanc versus Pierre Leblanc, and you wouldn't know which one was which, and how do you know on the ballot? They decided to add the name of the political party next to the candidate. But then they said, well, how are we going to know this person is really who they say they are? So they decided, okay, we'll have to have the leader of the party sign off that this person has the support of the party. And they accidentally created a great big club of threat the leader of all the parties can say, well, if you don't do what I tell you, I'm not going to let you run. I'll pull your nomination paper. By the way, sure, forgive me, I'm going to digress from my own digression to say that we recently saw the story in the media about Senator Don Meredith. Okay. Don Meredith's political trajectory started when Stephen Harper decided he did not like the democratically nominated candidate for the Conservatives in the Toronto Centre by election. This was the by-election where Bob Ray won his seat. I think it was 2010, but I could be wrong. It could have been 2009 when Bob Ray got back in the House of Commons. But in that by-election, the Conservatives in Toronto Centre had nominated a guy named Mark Warner. He's a black lawyer in the community who refused to do something that the Conservative hierarchy demanded. Here's what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to remove from his website and from his CV his involvement in a fight on HIV AIDS. They wanted him to remove from his CV that he attended the World AIDS Congress. And he refused to remove those things from his website because the, the leader of the party gets to sign the nomination papers. They pulled him as a candidate and they put Don Meredith in instead. And then Don Meredith's reward he came in fourth in that by-election. The Green Party candidate came in far ahead. But, okay, I'm not ahead of Bob Ray. Then Don Meredith went to the Senate. So this is pretty fundamental to democracy that the leader of the party should not have the power to pull somebody unilaterally against the wishes of the people of their party. This is where the Reform Party came in. This was one of Preston Manning's fundamental points, that the people of the local riding association get to nominate their candidates. So that's what Michael Chong's bill would have done there. The other thing Michael Chong's bill would have done is to say that in all Westminster parliamentary democracies, when you think about this, you know it, but we don't think about it very much. And we're the same system of government as the UK. But the parliamentary caucus of a party can remove their leader. So Margaret Thatcher was defeated not by a general election in the UK, but when her caucus said, you're not our leader anymore. We're going to pick John Major. Same thing happened a couple times recently in Australia. Julia Gillard to um, <coughs> right, Kevin Rudd and then back to Julia Gillard again. Oh, the other way around. Kevin Rudd to Julia Gillard and then back to Kevin Rudd again. So what, what Michael's bill did was say, look, the parliamentary caucus, when there are X percent, and he changed the percent a few times to try to get people on board, can, can uh, create and demand a leadership review. So they wouldn't have the same, and we never changed our laws in Canada, it's only been a matter of convention and the way it's gone, that we don't have this anymore. Where a parliamentary caucus could say, gee, we've had enough of Jean Chrétien, we're going to get rid of him now, right? Parliamentary caucuses have been reduced in their power by the growth in power of organized political parties. And because leaders of Canadian parties in a system that apes the American system, get elected in big political party conventions. The constitution of the political parties, which is obviously not part of Canadian law, except that they're like private societies, says you can't replace a leader without going back to the membership. So Michael Chung's bill called the Reform Act would have done these things. To get everybody on side to get his bill to second reading to get it to committee, he had to water it down. Because neither the Liberals nor the NDP would take getting rid of the leader's signature. And obviously, hard to get the Conservatives to do it either. So his bill got so watered down, and I have to say that by the time it got to third reading in Parliament, I didn't vote for it. I was torn about it because I like Michael, and I know that the bill overall might have done more good.
would have been harmed, but because people saw it as a reform act, they might think it actually accomplished what it set out to do. It had gotten very compromised. All things being equal, I'd still like to see it get through the Senate. It's now been reported out of the Senate committee. It's for a vote before the whole Senate. It may have already passed, because I missed what happened last night in the Senate. I'll have to double check. I hope it passes before the Senate rises for the summer. I mean, even though I didn't vote for it, I knew it was going to pass in the House when I decided not to vote for it. I just felt, and Michael was very sweet. He came over and I told him I wasn't going to vote for it anymore. And he said, look, people, I, and I said, you're not worried that you're not going to pass it. He said, no, we've got the votes to pass it. But he said, across Canada, you're the leader people look to for defending democracy. So if you don't vote for it, it won't look good for my bill. And I did promise him that if he was having troubles in the Senate, I'd try to help him get it through. So I have been trying. But that's what it is. That's what it would do. It was not so much focused on the PMO as on the political clout of every leader, regardless of whether they're prime minister or not. Susan. Can you talk a little about C24? C24B. The Pipeline Safety Act? Oh, the, uh, sort of the tiered citizenship. Oh, yeah, C24. Sorry about that. So C23 was Pipeline Safety. C24, tiered citizenship is to say, well, there's a couple of different changes to citizenship that have come in under Harper. One is to say that if you've been overseas for a while, you can't vote. That one really worries me. So Canadian citizens typically, and a lot of Canadian citizens haven't lost their love of country to serve overseas. They may be for work reasons or that may be a career or even as a diplomat, you may be overseas for quite a long time. So that's one change in citizenship is to say you can't vote. But the one you're talking about is where uh, the assumption that there are dual citizenships out there, that if you commit certain crimes, your citizenship can be stripped. Now, there is an international convention against statelessness. So no country can strip someone of citizenship and create essentially a, a a global orphan who has no citizenship home. But if they can make the case that there's any claim whatsoever of dual citizenship, they can strip you of citizenship if you have been convicted of a certain number of crimes, particularly terrorist crimes. Our view is you should, citizenship is citizenship is citizenship. And we've never had provisions of stripping someone of citizenship. We've said if, you've convict, if you're convicted of a crime, you go to jail. You stay in jail, but you're still a citizen. So I think this is a very slippery slope and not a good idea. Especially since people now increasingly are being told they're dual citizenships of countries that they didn't know they were a dual citizen of. So how did it sort of just mean to sneak up? And there it was. I mean, I never saw anything about it. And as a dual citizen, my children are dual citizens. Yeah. And even if they weren't, they really are, right? Yeah. Because of who I am. We have debated it in the House. I mean, it didn't get a lot of media coverage. It's one I should have talked about because I did put amendments forward on that one as well. Uh, I regard it as very dangerous because it does politicize citizenship. It makes it a very loosey-goosey concept. Instead of, you're a citizen, you have your passport, that's your citizenship. You're not changing that. That's not a mutable concept. And it shouldn't be susceptible to an ideological rejection of something that you've done. If you've done something wrong and you have to pay your time, you go to jail. There's also, I mean, they've treated citizens very differently for years now. For instance, uh, Canadian citizens on death row in the US always have the full force of Cana uh, Canadian diplomacy to get them removed from death row because Canada does not approve of capital punishment. We don't have capital punishment. So previous prime ministers would always go to bat for even, you know, cold-blooded murderers, but if they were on death row in the US, we want them to do, serve their term here. There's a lot of this kind of incredible punitive stuff. There's another one about um, basically throwing away the key. Life means life provision. The worst serial killers, murderers in Canadian jails, like, a, 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 well, they're never gonna get out. A judge is gonna look, perhaps, at the possibility of parole, but if someone's serving consecutive terms, for brutal murders, and there, there are certain people who are just never getting out of jail. But for political reasons, they've brought forward this very much at the last minute, life means life, as though our judges are lenient, our jails are revolving doors, and we know that really isn't the case. Can anything slip in more to this bill? I mean, I know that it's set up in terms, but my, my oh. the slippery slope thing is exactly what I was saying. See, we're going to have to repeal a lot of legislation because as long as it's on the books that citizenship is a mutable concept, there are risks. And I think it's much more appropriate to ensure
ensure that people understand that citizenship also implies rights and responsibilities, that we understand citizenship. I mean, it plays both ways. If you start saying your citizenship is something we can take away from you, we don't want people to devalue citizenship. It's a huge commitment to a country. And it's a commitment that goes both ways. It gives you rights, it also gives you responsibilities and duties. And if somebody breaks the law overseas or breaks the law in Canada, we shouldn't have the right to say, okay, we're stripping you of citizenship and sending you back to wherever you were from. Even for people who have been born here, but through other acts, as you point out your own kids, could be considered dual citizens. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll limit myself to one clarification and one question. Clarification on C-59, it has to go through the Senate. When does the Senate recess and can it possibly get oil sent since Parliament is recessed? So, you know, I'm hoping that that can't get passed. So. It probably will pass because they want it to pass. They've gotten it through the House now. It's before the Senate. Oh, there's a hand up in the back. About Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. I'm hearing it down here, and I forgot my promise to repeat questions. Thank you. The question is about Omnibus Budget Bill C-59. It's now, so the question is, it's gone through the House, but can it possibly get through the Senate? And with the House adjourned, can it possibly get royal assent? And so that's, the answer is, unfortunately, it will probably pass the Senate because they won't let the Senate rise till they get through all the things they care about. They cared about this one. By the way, this last session of Parliament broke all the records historically in Canada ever for applying time limits on debates, time allocation on debates. So if, when I say they want this bill passed, we know they want it passed because they apply time allocation on second reading, on time in committee, on our clause by clause work, on report stage, on third reading. They pushed it through fast. I forgot to tell you one thing about the law. There's a lot I can say about C-59. Another provision that I think is unconstitutional is putting the RCMP in charge of kill security because going back to 1500, the Speaker of the House is in charge of the security of members of Parliament, not the government of the day, for good reason. So they've changed that, and now that the RCMP will be put in charge of House of Commons and Senate security. This was all pushed through without adequate study. I know they want it through. The Senate has not risen for the summer yet, and I expect the Senate will not rise till they push this through. And royal assent comes from Rideau Hall and doesn't require that we're in session. Okay, and my question is, if because of the Kinder Morgan pipeline, there is a disastrous spill on the coast, who has liability? Because Kinder Morgan has said, hey, not our responsibility, it's our pipeline. Once it gets in the water, it's not our problem. <laughs> so, you know, who has liability? Okay. The taxpayer? So the, the follow-up question, which is I think different, is what I don't think, but if there is a disaster spill on our coast from a Kinder Morgan, the pipeline delivers bitumen mixed with dilolith to Vancouver, and if there's a spill of that material once a tanker has left port, who is liable? And the answer is the tanker company, not Kinder Morgan. And most, I found out recently that most, at least in the case of super tankers, they, and they're mostly flying under foreign flag, they are each one separately incorporated so that they can go bankrupt and not be liable. So the, the now I'm not sure about the Aframax size tanker, because the Aframax tankers are the size that collect the bitumen and diluent from the port of Vancouver. But to have the huge expansion of that traffic that the Kinder Morgan expansion would create. I'm still, by the way, intervening in the Kinder Morgan pipeline process. A lot of people have withdrawn, notably Robin Allen, who's a brilliant economist. She has been part of that pipeline, and she wrote a brilliant letter for why she was withdrawing from the National Energy Board Review, because she said it was clear from the way the board was handling the evidence that they'd already made up their mind and it was a biased process. I'm staying in it largely because I've already retained a Toronto lawyer, Clayton Ruby, so we can sue them when it's over for a violation of the rules of natural justice unless they allow me to do oral cross-examination of the expert witnesses from, kin from the National Energy Board, from, from Kinder Morgan. So back to the liability issue. 
There are international rules for liability for spills at sea through Maripol. Uh, we did have already passed last year a bill that created uh, a collection of money to a shared fund for tanker spills. Uh, and that is, that is to be in compliance with a global treaty that deals with spills of hazardous materials at sea. But it's a, that's, but again, it's not meaningful if the individual tankers are separately incorporated and can declare bankruptcy and walk away from the spill. Of course, a Benjamin and Dillowin spill, we have no actual knowledge of what that does in a marine environment. We know from the Benjamin, Dillowin, Enbridge spill in the uh, Kalamazoo River in Michigan that it did not behave like crude. It behaved differently. And it has been virtually impossible to clean up. I mean, they still haven't cleaned it up when it's been here. And it's topped $1 billion uh, in the Kalamazoo River, the cost of trying to clean it up. So the answer would be the taxpayer. The answer for who would clean it up? Yes, the answer would be the taxpayer. Yeah, I read. I mean, and Catherine, <laughs> calling her mother's name. Goodness knows, Catherine. Sorry. And she's an honorable woman, too. She's very. <laughs>
international negotiations, we go as the conservative party, and we do not include MPs from any other parties. And that's never been the case before. I remember clearly, well, I've been to a ton of UN negotiations before I went to politics, where it would be, the, you know, you have all the opposition MPs plus civil society groups. Anyway, the negotiations, uh, now Jim Prentice was one exception, give him credit. When Jim Prentice was Minister of Environment for Canada, Canada's delegation to Copenhagen did include the NDP and the Liberals and the Bloc. Of course, I wasn't elected yet, so it didn't include us. But I was there on my own hook with the Global Greens. But to get in the back room to understand what's happening in the real negotiations, you need to be with a country. With a, that, that, so you're a party to the negotiations, and a party badge gets you into where the real discussions are happening. So that's just to explain why in Warsaw at COP19, I was with the delegation of Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> There were only three Afghanistani bureaucrat diplomats. They, only one of them had good English. And the negotiations in the side rooms, despite the fact that the UN system has eight official languages and usually has translation for everything, the weird thing of negotiations is that the clusters, the hubs, and the back rooms, and when I say back rooms, it can be a room bigger than this, where everyone's hammering out one part of one aspect of what's supposed to go in the treaty. And it's all in English. So I had the Afghanistani delegation, and there's, they have, it, it's a long story, but anyway, I ended up with Afghanistan. <laughs> and I was in the room with the group called the G77 in China for the caucuses before the main meeting. I was with, for the first time in my life, and it was a real treat, because I'd always wondered, you know, if you're, if you're a Western uh, environmentalist, you always want to know what's been going on inside that room with what's called the G77 in China. You know, blondes don't get in. So <laughs> there I am with Afghanistan. And they were, I have to say, it was a treat to see how they really function. High order diplomacy because the G77 in China includes the poorest countries on earth, the least developed countries. It includes the low lying island states with the most at risk from sea level rise. It includes India, China, and Brazil, huge growing economies that are polluting. And it includes the Arab states, Saudi Arabia, right? So I had this weird conversation where the head of the Afghan delegation wanted me to meet a friend of his who was on the Saudi Arabian delegation. <laughs> and so I met this man in his lovely flowing robes, and he said, and you're a Canadian member of parliament. Yes. So when I met Ban Ki-moon, well, actually, Ban Ki-moon knew I was Canadian. He saw I had my Afghan, I said, I said Afghanistan? I said, Yes, I know. I said, I'm an environmental refugee. Bad <laughs> <laughs> people got it right away. But anyway, I was there talking to the Saudi Arabian delegate, and he said, I want you to know that when your government came to me, he said, I'm on the Credentials Bureau, which in the, in the Kyoto Protocol, which means he was one of the top diplomats from anywhere in the world whose job was to make sure that the countries that had signed and ratified the convention, were there in good standing. So when Canada decided to leave Kyoto, the first step was to deliver a letter to give one year written notice that we were leaving. And they delivered it to this Saudi Arabian delegate. And he said, when, they, when your country came to me to leave, he said, I, I tried to talk them out of it. I told them it would hurt the convention, and I told them there are no penalties under the Kyoto Protocol. There's no reason to leave, even if you don't do your, even if you don't reach your target, even if you don't pick a new target. There's no reason for you to exit the Kyoto Protocol. I tried to explain to them, and of course I said I tried to tell them. I I know there's no penalties, huh? so I must have been a bit emotional because he suddenly put his arm around me, and he said, "Don't worry," he said. We all know this isn't really Canada. <laughs> so, what are the chances, Catherine, that Saudi Arabia is more committed to climate action than Canada? It's kind of like, what are the chances the Vatican gets science more than, I don't know. I, I could be wrong about what they're doing behind the scenes, but what I see in the room is that they're not walking in. They're not, you know, believe me, they're not.
They have, and they have, it's interesting, it does seem from afar that their economies are totally dependent on oil. And I'm no fan of Saudi Arabia, by the way, having just told you that touching story. I think it's outrageous that we've sold them tanks. Mm -hmm. What they're doing right now in Yemen is an illegal war, and the situation in Yemen in terms of beheadings and, and potential failed state and refugee and humanitarian crisis. And we're not willing to separate ourselves from Saudi Arabia in terms of giving, selling the military aid. Although we realize that with our dollar falling, the tanks that Saudi Arabia bought from us, they saved about $3 billion on tanks when our dollar dropped in value, you know, because they're paying U.S. dollars. The, uh, the, uh, the selling of military hardware to Saudi Arabia is something I don't think has gotten nearly enough attention. Anyway, next, yes. I have a, um, my big question is about CBC. How are we doing with that? Well, the situation for, the question is what do we do about CBC? I think the situation for public broadcasting requires a public commitment, which doesn't put it on the same playing field with commercial television. So the idea, well, CBC isn't holding on to its audience, so therefore we give it less money. Or CBC is an extravagance. We need CBC and Radio Canada as an aspect of protecting our culture, protecting democracy, protecting being able to tell each other our stories. We don't hang together as a country without shared information and actually shared narrative. So I think Peter Zosky in Morningside did more to bring Canadians together coast to coast to coast than anything for years. And if we lose CBC, and we're, I think we're really at risk of, well, you're sitting two seats down from Joanne Roberts. So now I'm gonna have to say, <laughs> for 
support the promotion of talent in Canada in filmmaking, in screenplays, in acting, in all the things we know we can do and produce. So that we, uh, for every dollar invested in public broadcasting for this kind of creative endeavor, we get a multiplier times four because it has, it's, it's an economic stimulus in arts and culture and programming and filmmaking and storytelling and miniseries. I don't know how many of you watching the little miniseries out of Denmark that I'm addicted to, Borgen. <laughs> Anyone seen Borgen? Well, if a country like Denmark can produce Borgen, you know, we, we have, we've, lost, we've lost a lot of our commitment to public broadcasting as a goal that isn't just about having another channel that needs to compete with CTV and Global. And by the way, it's not fair to the commercial stations to have them compete for the same stupid schlock. If we want stupid schlock, we have tons of networks for that. I think CBC should stay schlockless. It's <laughs> <laughs> the new motto. Yeah, I don't think it's going to catch on at the bottom. So, yeah. I'm concerned about the change of who's allowed to vote. It seems that they're trying to get rid of seniors, yeah. young people, and poor people. How can, how can we respond to that? The question was, her concern is about who is allowed to vote, and her impression is that they're trying, they being the current government, trying to get away from certain groups of people voting, making it harder for seniors to vote, young people to vote, poor people to vote, and a lot of First Nations. How about people with disabilities? People with disabilities. Can add a lot to the, 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 what we call the, it was Bill C-23 in a previous session. The problem, the numbers keep changing, you get new C-23s, but the, they called it the Fair Elections Act. I think most people call it the Unfair Elections Act. Did a couple of things that make it harder for people in those categories to vote. Now you might wonder why is it harder for seniors to vote? Because that should be easy. And I think that's an unintended consequence of the law. Is that if you've given up your driver's license, and that mostly affects us when we're seniors. There, you're going to find it harder to vote because you're going to have to prove who you are and where you live, and this and it has to be a government issued photo ID. If, and, a, and I'm particularly worried about seniors because we're so used to knowing how to vote. Go to the same polling station. We're very unlikely to be aware ahead of time to go early to make sure. So if you go on voting day and then you find you're, you're rejected and you have to go home and try to root around for paperwork, you might miss your chance to vote. That did happen to seniors in 2008 that I knew personally. So uh, that's one concern. And for young people, if you've moved from one, if you don't have, uh, if you've gone to university, for example, you want to vote where you are at university, you can have a driver's license that proves you are who you say you are, but if it's tied to your home address and you're in a new place to vote, you won't be allowed to vote unless you can also prove where you live now. So what we need to do, and I'm really urging people to take it seriously as a commitment, to help people by making sure that you find people who are in this category, and a lot of people who are homeless, it's going to be a real challenge. But find people who are going to be likely to find it harder to vote and bring them to the advance poll so that if there's something wrong with their paperwork, you've got fallback time to fix it. We need to get voter turnout to go up across Canada, and I think the best way is to use a buddy system. Bring, take it on as a little challenge, bring someone to the polls, and go to the advanced poll to make sure you can vote. I think so, so you were, one more question. Can I just, can oh, add that question. But, no. um, the new British Columbia service card, which we all need to have uh, if we don't have a driver's license uh, for our health insurance, et cetera, uh, is photo issued ID with your address on it and is government issued ID. Yeah, that should work. For BC. For BC. For BC. Yeah. So are these in your own constituency? Yeah, but I don't have one of those yet myself, but I just... But you have a driver's license. I have my driver's license. Yeah. So any senior that doesn't have a That's driver's right. license but has a, a card to get their name in BC. So, uh, so anybody else have any more questions? Or I can take one more, Susan says, and then we'll be at the 3.30. We have to get her to a ferry. Oh, that's right, I have to get to a ferry, I forgot. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes, sir. I wonder if you might make a comment about Bethany McLaughlin and whether you think it's appropriate for her to make comments that uh, are normally considered outside the purview of the Supreme Court. Well, I, you know, I, I am on the, uh, as a lawyer, I have to confess that. I suppose I'm always in awe of Supreme Court judges. That they're not people who are who are prone to flippant remarks. I think 
from having studied it extensively and believing that that was the appropriate term. She's not likely to have any cases that come before us where that is a determination that affects her judgment in a way that's inappropriate, so I personally had no trouble with it. If she were to pronounce on something that was likely to come before the court and express a personal opinion before it comes before the court, that would be inappropriate. But I think making a jet, as, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, good, was using, I think there's, there's a fair degree of acknowledgement that the residential school system over seven generations of taking children away from their parents and putting them through, in some cases, torture, is no word for it, but torture, but certainly, at a minimum, depriving them of their ability to speak their language, learn their culture, and, and, and in most cases also face significant physical and personal deprivations, that that did amount to cultural genocide. And I, I don't have any problem with her saying it, but again, as a matter of legality, she wasn't pronouncing on something that was ever likely to come before her as a jurist. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's that. I just want to say that this is your report from me as your member of parliament through the 41st parliament of this country. I hope very much to be a member of parliament for the 42nd parliament. But the